Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Wallace. We are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in the drum tap section and we turn now to a poem called A March in the Ranks Hard Pressed and the Road Unknown. Now this is poem 16 of the 43 of drum taps and this is again one of those really difficult poems to experience and read. And yet I think it's absolutely necessary that we do so. Um, I want to remind you that uh, Whitman said into the old cause, uh, my book and the war are one. There are so uh, many poems where we can, uh, we can make this observation so clearly and it's certainly going to be in a poem like this because Whitman spent so much of his time in hospitals working with the wounded, the dying, and he's going to share all of that in a compelling photographic image. We've said great poets will show not tell and here we're going to see one of the more compelling showings. Um, now our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net down the left hand side talks with Walt. We worked all the way from inscriptions up through and including an introductory set of comments for drum taps. We just finished with Vigil Strange and now we will turn um, to uh, March in the Ranks. Um, let's turn now to our uh, Nortons for just a moment. This poem and the following, A Sight in Camp, among others, report the scenes of war with an authenticity which in the 1860s anticipated the realism of Stephen Crane and much later, Ernest Hemingway. Their modernity, Norton's continues, unappreciated at the time, was achieved by on-the-spot notation in this instance in a Washington hospital notebook of 1863 to 64. Um, we, we have actually some of this transcribed and notebook pages with their trial lines upon which Whitman drew for the particular scene invoked in this poem. This poem remained unchanged in the drum taps group through all editions. Uh, now, we're going to be referencing the Battle of White Oaks uh, and the White Oaks Church, as it sometimes is referred to, in November of 62, um, there in Stafford um, County, Virginia. We'll read the poem and then we'll exegete. A march in the ranks hard pressed in the road unknown, a route through a heavy wood with muffled steps in the darkness. Our army foiled with loss severe and the sullen remnant retreating, till after midnight glimmer upon us the lights of a dim lighted building. We come to an open space in the woods and halt by the dim lighted building. Tis a large old church at the crossing roads, now an impromptu hospital. Entering but for a minute, I see a sight beyond all the pictures and poems ever made. Shadows of deepest, deepest black, just lit by moving candles and lamps. And by one great pithy torch, stationary with wild red flame and clouds of smoke. By these crowds, groups of forms, vaguely I see on the floor, some in the pews laid down. At my feet, more distinctly, a soldier, a mere lad, in danger of bleeding to death, he is shot in the abdomen. I staunch the blood temporarily, the youngster's faith, face is white as a lily. Then. Before I depart, I sweep my eyes over the scene, fain to observe it all. I'm sorry, fain to absorb it all. Faces, varieties, postures beyond description, most in obscurity, some of them dead. Surgeons operating, attendants holding lights, the smell of either the odor of blood, the crowd, oh, the crowd of the bloody forms, the yard outside also filled, some on the bare ground, some on planks or stretchers, some in the death spasm sweating an occasional scream or cry, the doctor shouted orders or calls, the glisten of the little steel instruments catching the glint of the torches. These I resume as I chant, I see again the forms, I smell the odor. Then here outside, the order's given, fall in, my men, fall in. But first, I bend to the dying lad, his eyes open, a half smile gives he me. Then the eyes close, calmly close, and I speed forth to the darkness, 
resuming, marching, ever in darkness, marching on in the ranks, the unknown road, still marching. It is significant, of course, that nothing is said, right? In terms of what he says to anyone there, it's, we're back to I sit and look out. You remember this, I see here and am silent. I think this poem has to take us back to that poem. Let's exegete now. Notice we begin with movement in the march in the ranks. We're hard pressed. It's the only time in all leaves of grass hard pressed gets used. It's here. The road is unknown. Notice it's not the song of the open road. It's not the open road. Here it's a road that's unknown. What exactly is it that we're, we're doing? It's unknown. A route through a heavy wood. Uh, reading drum taps, as I've said to you guys, reading drum taps, I think you have to have in the back of your mind constantly Dante's Divine Comedy, especially Inferno. We've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net, and I would challenge you to go back and review those. Notice we're in a heavy wood with muffled steps in the darkness. This in the darkness phrase will get used in poets to come, as well as, ironically, Song of the Open Road, Passage 7. Our army, notice it's our and then it's I, our army foiled with loss severe, and the sullen remnant retreating, it's powerful this use of the word sullen, Go, go and take a look at here the tremble to see how that word gets used. Notion of remnant takes us back to Song of Exposition, Passage 9. It is as well, remnant um, uh, for Whitman's audience would have been as well a religious term, a biblical term. Notice retreating. So there's going to be a loss of a victory, the retreating. We're back to the, to the till, and notice the movement in the narrative. Till after midnight, glimmer upon us the lights. And, Again, the notion of hope. This is going to be one of these poems that's just despairing in the way in which where is the hope. And yet we'll, we'll get to the lily. I mean, we'll get to it. Every one of these poems will have some element of, of, of the hope. Again, a sustained theodicy. Midnight glimmer upon us the lights of a dim lighted building. This will be the White Oaks Church. We come to an open space in the woods. I, I cannot help but think about uh, Conrad's classic Heart of Darkness and the Grove scene. We've given a lecture on it at LearnStrong.net. Compelling. Go back and, and, and read that after reading this. And it's amazing how both of these uh, texts will provide that provocative image. Open space in the woods. Home by the dim lighted building. Tis an old church at the crossing roads. Think about Oedipus at the crossroads, right? Now an impromptu hospital. I told you guys, eight times the word hospital gets used in drum taps. It is for Whitman the symbol of all symbols, right? He spent so much time there. Entering but for a minute, this is just going to be a glimpse. I see a sight, and then he'll say it. Beyond all the pictures and poems ever made, including the Iliad and the Aeneid. That is to say, it's translinguistic, the suffering, the horror he's about to witness. And then shadows. And of course... For Whitman and his audience, because they would know it well, we've got to go to Republic Book 7, and of course the cave allegory and the shadows on the wall. Shadows of deepest, notice how he repeats, and he does this several times in drum taps for emphases. He repeats the same word, deepest, deepest black. I told you about the way in which he uses coloration all the way through drum taps. Deepest black, just lit by moving candles and lamps, so the idea of just a little bit of light. And obviously we've seen this already with fitful flame. And by one great pitchy torch, stationary with wild, it's interesting these, these, these word choices, wild red flame and clouds of smoke. By these crowds, groups of forms. Notice it's, it's like we're not even sure what we're looking at. Vaguely I see on the floor some in the pews laid down. We're at a church. And instead of sitting in a pew and worshiping, now we're laying in pews and suffering many to die. At my feet, more distinctly, and again, that just that, that at my feet just takes you immediately to Conrad's Heart of Darkness and the Grove scene there. More distinctly a soldier, and then it's just going to be a mere lad. So notice, poem after poem emphasizes how youth are destroyed. We cannot help but think of the classic novel, uh, um, Catch-22, and as well, All Quiet on the Western Front, to try to portray... Often it is just a mere lad in danger of bleeding to death. And then, just as a side note, almost as if he, for a moment, is the surgeon who's just commenting, uh, he's shot in the abdomen, which is one of the 
many, many ways that young men would linger on and, and, and a shot to the abdomen would, would uh, ultimately lead to their, un, to, to their death. And then all of a sudden it's I, and it's I staunch the blood. And again, Whitman did this very thing. So now, of course, it becomes very much lived experience for Whitman. I staunch the blood temporarily, and then back to parenthetics, the, youngers, the youngster's face is white as a lily. And then here's the, the lily, the symbol of hope. It's quite remarkable in the middle of all of this. And then the word then, from till to then, then, before I depart. And of course, this is the compelling fact of this poem. This entire poem is one sentence. All 25 lines is nothing more than, let me tell you what I see next. It's literally like walking in with a video camera or your phone in for, for us today and just videotaping what it is that's being so. And then, you know, often with these kinds of videotapes, then we'll, we'll focus in, you know. And so now, now here we go with that. Before I depart, I sweep my eyes over the scene Fain to absorb it all. It's impossible to capture. And I think this is what all great poets, certainly what Whitman set out to do, was to absorb it all. And then it is. Faces, varieties, postures, notice three. Beyond description. He says this twice in this poem. that You just can't. It's translinguistic. I cannot express the horror. Most in obscurity, some of them dead, this word obscurity is a compelling word for this poem. That is to say, most of these young lads, these young men will die, and very few people will know at all who they were and why they left. We're then going to focus on the surgeons. Later it will be the doctors. Surgeons operating, although that word obviously is a, it's, it's a joke of a word to argue that any operations are actually happening. Attendants holding lights, and then... That all five of the senses are elicited in this poem. The smell of ether, the odor of blood, the crowd, and then the use of the word O, oh, the crowd of the bloody forms. This, I, this image is going to be compelling all the way through reading of Drum Dubs. I've had, I've had people who tell me they've read every word of Leaves of Grass right up until Drum Taps in some of these poems, and they have to just shut it down. They can't do it. It's the same compelling, nightmarish observations they make about reading Dante and some of those descriptions that Dante will give us of Inferno and parts of hell that are just beyond, beyond our capacity to read and appreciate. Bloody forms, and then all of a sudden notice we start kind of moving out. The yard outside, also filled, some on the bare ground, some on planks or stretchers. Notice these use repetition use or some. Some in the death spasm, sweating. I told you early on the, the power of sweating. We had sweating horses in an earlier poem. Here now sweating. An occasional scream or cry, so we go from smell to, to auditory. The doctor shouted orders or calls. I mean, imagine the post-traumatic stress that the physicians, the surgeons, and the doctors have to live with for the rest of their life after these kinds of experiences. And then a very interesting word, the glisten, and this line is a fascinating line, let's not overlook it. The glisten of the little steel instruments catching the glint of the torches. Well, these little steel instruments are, of course, going to hopefully try to provide some kind of pain relief, but we also know that some of these steel instruments will, in fact, be saws. That will be the primary way that often these kinds of situations are going to be addressed is just simply amputation. Can we point out as well that technology is being emphasized. I told you guys earlier that the cannons as technology were glittering. Now all of a sudden we've got glistening glittering of other technologies. The idea that some technologies require the use of other technologies horrifyingly. The glint of the torches. These I resume as I chant. And again, we're back to this Whitman as poet, as chanter. I see again the forms. We've seen this construction of I see. I smell the odor. And obviously he's trying to have us to experience the same. Then here, now we're going to hear something else. Outside. The order's given. And then of course in italics, fall in my men, fall in. Now this is interesting. Of course fall in is the language that will say it's time for us to get back into order, back into rank. Of course fall in can also mean as in to fall in to what? A grave. Notice it's here. It's as if he has fallen into a, 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 a you know, like one of Dante's cantos, like into one of the, uh, one of the circles of hell. 
and you know, here it is. I've got to go out because I got to go back. But first, to come back, the genius, the brilliance of this poem. I bend to the dying lad, which will take us back to the to the previous poem, Vigil Strange. His eyes open, and then a half smile gives he me. Notice the only thing given in this poem is this smile and the use of Lily from earlier now. A half smile gives he me. Then the eyes close, calmly close. Again, notice the repeating of the word. And I speed forth to the darkness. Well, I mean, from one horror to the next horror, in other words. This interlude, and that's all it's been, it's just a brief interlude. And now, off I go, he says, to the darkness. Notice, resuming, marching, ever in darkness, marching again, the repetition of some of these words. On in the ranks, the unknown, back to the first line, road, still marching. I think the most compelling word in the entire poem is the word still. That notion of still, as in ongoing, still, as in to cease, for just a moment to cease. It's a compelling use of the word. I think that T.S. Eliot learned how to use the word still from his study of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Well, how are we going to finish such a difficult poem? I know these are, guys, these are hard poems, and for those of you who are struggling to get through this, I'm, I'm telling you, there's a reason for us to read this, but man, is it hard to read stuff like this. I get it, to read it and to experience it. But in 2A, what are we going to say? Well, the horrors of war for Whitman still marching. This idea of still is a compelling word to me. The cost of freedom is, of course, we will say, usually the young. And obscurity is a, the other word here that's just brutal. At 2B, we've mentioned it, 25 lines, all one sentence, quite a remarkable accomplishment. Um, in some ways, think of this. This is when we're back to Whitman's cataloging. We saw so much of this cataloging in Song of Myself and elsewhere. But notice, this cataloging isn't doing what the other cataloging was doing, showing a, an attempt to try and show some kind of democratic unity and all of that. This one, of course, is a different kind of cataloging, the cataloging, and we might say, of horror. Uh, and then, of course, word choice. The, a word like Lily, for example, is a symbol of hope. I've mentioned Conrad's Heart of Darkness. We obviously mentioned Republic 7. Um, it, I, I think there's just so many different ways. All Quiet on the Western Front comes to mind. I mean, what are the, what are the titles for you that, that work here? And then finally at 3B, how can we own a poem like this? Well, when was the last time that you witnessed terrible suffering? And how did you respond to that terrible suffering? And how do we respond to poems such as this? And I must warn us, still poems to come. I, I, I'm sorry, but it's true. Thank you.